Good morning. Today I'm reading out of the NIV Bible from Romans 8 verses 12 to 25. Listen to the Word of God. Life through the Spirit. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Future glory. I consider that your present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into glor the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as it is in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope is that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. God always blesses the reading of his word. Amen. Good morning and welcome to those of you from uh, Somerset West United who have joined in this service this morning and some of our own people from Durbanville. I'm coming to you from our congregation in Durbanville, but uh, I'll be at Somerset West uh, for the service on the 30th of May on Trinity Sunday, and it's a joy to be able to bring God's word to you. Uh, and as we come to hear and receive God's word, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This Trinity Sunday, there are two things that I will use to guide our thoughts. The first, the scripture from Romans chapter 8, what I call the greatest chapter in the Bible. And the second, from a small book written by Henry Nouwen called The Life of the Beloved. I believe out of these two resources, we will have a wonderful picture of what it means to live in the reality of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When Henry Nouwen says that we are God's beloved, he means that we are intimately loved long before our parents or teachers or spouses or children or friends loved or even wounded us. That's the truth of our lives. That's the truth we have to claim for ourselves. That's the truth spoken by the voice that says to us, you are my beloved. Listen to that voice with great inner attentiveness. I hear at my center words that say, I have called you by name from the very beginning. You are mine and I am yours. You are my beloved. On you my favor rests. I have molded you in the depths of the earth and knitted you together in your mother's womb. I have carved you on the palms of my hands and hidden you in the shadow of my embrace. I look at you with infinite tenderness and care for you with a care more intimate than that of a mother for her child. I have counted every hair on your head and guided you at every step. Wherever you go, I go with you. Wherever you rest, I keep watch. I will give you food that will satisfy all your hunger and drink that will quench all your thirst. I will not hide my face from you. You know me as your own, as I know you as my own. You belong to me. I am your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your lover, and your spouse. And yes, even your child. Wherever you are, I will be. Nothing will ever separate us because we are one. Now, we're only a week on the other side of Pentecost, 
And so it's important to acknowledge that this is what the Holy Spirit does for us. The Holy Spirit is the one who enables us to hear God say deep in our hearts, you are my beloved. And it's the Holy Spirit who enables us to grow into that reality. To identify the movements of the Holy Spirit in our lives, no one uses four words, taken, blessed, broken, and given. And these words summarize our life as ministers of the sacrament, because when we come together around the table with members of the community, we take bread, we bless the God who gave it to us, we break it and we give it. But these words also summarize our lives as Christ followers, as disciples of Christ, as Christians. I am called to become bread for the world, bread that is taken in God's hand, blessed by God, broken and then given. Most importantly, however, these words summarize our lives as human beings because in every moment of our lives, somewhere, somehow, the taking, the blessing, the breaking, and the giving are happening. So we are the beloved, and we are becoming the beloved, and in the process of becoming what God has already made us to be, firstly, we are taken. It might help at this point if instead of take, which is somehow a cold and rather brittle word, we used a warmer and softer word that means the same thing. The word choose. As children of God, we are God's chosen ones. Paul puts it this way in Romans 8 and verse 15. He says this, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about by your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry out, Abba, Father. Paul tells us that we are taken into the hands of the Father, chosen to be the children of God. Now, to accept our chosenness means that we have to live each day, or can live each day, with a sense of purpose. We live in the assurance that we have been taken into the compassionate hands of God the Father and accept that our lives are not an accident. We are not a loose collection of atoms randomly put together, but rather created in the image of God, taken into the hands of God our Father and chosen to be, as a consequence, recipients of God's favor. To accept our chosenness means that we can live with that sense of purpose. But secondly, to accept our chosenness means we can live patiently, always unmasking the world about us for what it is, manipulative, controlling, power-hungry, and in the long run, destructive. To live patiently means you have to keep looking for people and places where the, the actual truth is spoken and where you're reminded of your deepest identity as, as the chosen one. Patient living means taking time to celebrate our chosenness constantly. This means that saying thank you to God for having chosen me, for having chosen you, and thank you to all those who remind me of my chosenness. Gratitude is the most fruitful way of deepening our consciousness that we are not an accident but a divine choice. So, you are beloved. Long before you were born, when you were born and baptized, God claimed you as his beloved son or daughter, and you are growing into that very identity. You are growing into the, the beloved that you were created to be. And the God who chose you has taken you in his hand, and he will not let you go. That's the first thing I want to say today, that we are taken, we are chosen by God the Father, and as a result we can live with purpose and with patience. Second thing that we hear is that we have been blessed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the focus of Romans chapter 8. The Spirit is only mentioned twice in Romans before this chapter, but in this chapter alone the Holy Spirit is mentioned 19 times. And Paul describes the work of the Holy Spirit in cooperative terms. I have a part to play in this process. It's not something that happens automatically when I call myself a Christian, having been baptized and having, been, having grown up in the church and having prayed the sinner's prayer or something else and having accepted Jesus into my life. 
No, there has to be some sort of conscious decision to work out what it means every day to walk by the Spirit. Paul makes this clear in the contrast of two mindsets in verses 5 to 8. He says, there are those who choose to live their lives according to their sinful nature, what he calls the flesh, and they have their minds set on what the sinful nature desires. They choose death. They are hostile to God. They do not submit to God's law. They cannot please God. On the other hand, he says, there are those who choose to follow through with their faith in Christ by submitting to the Spirit and to live in accordance with the Spirit, to live in step with the Spirit. They have their mind set on what the Spirit desires and they choose as a consequence life and peace. Now this might sound a little complicated, but actually it's a fairly accurate description of what we do every day. We make decisions every day about how to relate to God and how to relate to others. What is the basis of my daily relationship to God? And what is the basis of my daily relationship with others? Is my daily relationship to God based on a fearful expectation of judgment uh, or a set of items on some to-do list, which is to live by the sinful nature? Or is my relationship with God a loving response to a loving and caring Father, which is to live by the Spirit? What is my relationship with other people? Is it to manipulate and manage and push people aside and pretend to care for them in order to get what I want, which is to live by the sinful nature? Or is it genuinely to look out for the best in others, to want the best for them, to actively seek ways to assist people to be the best that they can be, which is to live by the Spirit? Now, how are we to live into this new world of life in Christ, blessed by the Holy Spirit? Well, it's it's firstly a call to prayer. For me personally, prayer becomes more and more a way to listen to uh, God speak to me. Prayer is not presenting God with a shopping list, but a moment of stillness when I step out of the whirl and whoosh of my ordinary life to be attentive to the voice of the Spirit. My second suggestion for claiming your blessedness is by the cultivation of presence. By presence, I mean attentiveness to the blessings that come to you day after day, moment by moment, year after year. One of the main problems that ministers have is distraction. We battle to live in the present, in the moment, because we are distracted by what to come. What is to come? The next sermon that we have to preach, the next pastoral interaction we have to undertake, the next session meeting. Together with prayer, I need to make the choice to be present in the moment, the now of my life. My distraction and refusal to attend to what is happening around me now means that I can easily miss what what God is doing around me at any given moment. And because I miss what God is doing, I don't know how to respond to the subtle moves of of the Holy Spirit in me and in the persons around me. I lose focus on what God is doing. So, we have been taken or chosen by God, and because we've been taken by God and chosen by Him, we can live with purpose and with patience. We have been blessed by the Holy Spirit, and so we can live with Uh, with prayer and presence. Thirdly, we are broken with the Holy Son. To be broken with the Son means to be crucified with Christ. It means to feel the agony between who we are and who God has called us to be and we not yet are. In this passage, Paul uses the analogy of childbirth. Now, many of us have pictures of our wives after they have delivered a child and They are wonderful pictures. Typically, our wives are there looking uh, somewhat tired but radiant. The the baby is in their arms. None of us have a picture of our wives in labor. We don't reach into our wallets and say, let me show you a picture of my wife Sally groaning in labor. Isn't agony wonderful? Creation will one day be delivered. And the difference between when it will be delivered and what it is now is the difference between agony and ecstasy. A bit like childbirth. Someday our groaning creation will come into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Think what will happen when nature is free to produce as it was designed to produce. Free from pestilence and danger. And friends, we are going to see that day. Now Paul talks in this passage about various groanings. 
Firstly, he says in, in Romans 8 and verse 22 that the creation groans. He says, we know that the whole of creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Now Paul's statement that the creation groans is, is not news to us. It should not be news to us. Simply working in the garden, clearing the weeds out of the flower beds, or farming with thorns and thistle among the stalks of good grain, or seeing the evidence of global warming and, and pollution and climate change and the effect that human beings are having upon the planet which is our home. All this groaning can be heard by anyone at any time. Paul's insight here, however, is that the whole creation, however innocent, was affected by our sinfulness so that its groaning might be a sign of the glory that is going to be revealed so that we might have hope for the redemption, not only of ourselves, but of the entire creation. So the creation groans. But Paul says as well that the Christian groans in verses 23 to 25. Not only so, he says in verse 23, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. The thing we groan for is to become what we already are. We are already the beloved of God, but we are on our way to become that. We are the beloved and we are becoming the beloved. We long for our full adoption as the children of God, which will be completed by the redemption of the body. We are already God's children, but we will not be complete for eternity and we'll get, until we get those new bodies that are promised to us in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 2 is a parallel passage. Meanwhile, we groan, <clears throat> longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Perhaps the simplest thing to say about our brokenness is that it reveals something of who we are. Our sufferings, our pains are not simply bothersome interruptions of our lives. Rather, it is our pain, our suffering that touches us in our uniqueness and our most intimate individuality. My groaning, my suffering is not the same as yours. We each suffer in our own way, individually and deeply personal. That's why when we deal with somebody who's been through a trauma, even though we've been through a similar thing in our lives, we never say, I know exactly how you feel, because each person's experience of pain and brokenness is absolutely unique. We also groan because of the misery of living in, a fall, in our fallen bodies in a fallen world. Friends, our brokenness, which leads to our groaning, is truly ours. It is nobody else's. Our brokenness is as unique as our chosenness and our blessedness. The way in which we are broken is, much, is as much an expression of our individuality as the way we are taken and blessed. Yes, fearsome as it may sound, as the beloved ones, we are called to claim a unique brokenness, just as we have been called to claim our unique chosenness and our unique blessedness. We also groan for a positive reason, Paul says in verse 23, because we have the first fruits of the Spirit. We have the first installment, or a kind of a down payment, on the inconceivably fabulous heritage that God has prepared for us. This is what God has done for us, by and in the Holy Spirit. That indescribable peace that we knew when we first experienced a, a, a feeling of our sins being forgiven, the power of God that calms our heart despite the circumstances, the joy that floods our souls, no matter what is going on out there, these are mere foretastes of what is to come. We are described in verse 23 as waiting eagerly. The same strong word is used of creation's waiting in verse 19. We are on tiptoe, waiting for our deliverance. Now Paul underlines this hope in verses 24 and 25. He says this, For in this hope we were saved. For, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? 
But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Here we find the same strong word repeated for us, uh, for emphasis. We wait for it patiently. We wait with perseverance. Life right now may be very hard. It might be exceptionally difficult. Or it might be very good. But in the future there will be joy supreme. I look forward to that time of deliverance from this body of sin. Glory that is beyond my capacity to imagine. Seeing the face of Christ. Experiencing the immense thrill of getting to know Him. And so do you. We groan. We have a deep longing which our greatest joys dimly foreshadow. Someday, someday we will know the fullness of our salvation. So if our brokenness is as part of us as anything else, if it's unique to us, how are we to deal with our brokenness? And I would suggest two ways. Firstly, that we should partner with it. And secondly, we should place it under the blessing. The first step to healing is not a step away from the pain, but to partner with it, to take a step in other words towards it when brokenness is in fact just as intimate a part of our being as our chosenness and our blessedness we have to dare to overcome our fear and become familiar with it yes we have to find the courage to embrace our brokenness, to make our most feared enemy into a friend and claim it as an intimate companion this means not, <clears throat> not denying what we have been through Not pretending it didn't happen, but seeing God's hand in the stuff that we've been through, even the difficult times. The deep truth is that our human suffering need not be an obstacle to the joy and peace we so desire, but it can become instead the means by which we get to it. The great secret of the spiritual life, the life of the beloved sons and daughters of God, is that everything we live, be it gladness or sadness, joy or pain, health or illness, can all be part of the journey towards the full realization of our humanity. It is not hard to say to one another, all that is good and beautiful leads to the glory of the children of God. But it's very hard to say, but didn't you know that we all have to suffer and thus enter into our glory? Nonetheless, Real care means the willingness to help each other in making our brokenness into a gateway to joy. So we need to partner with our brokenness. And secondly, we need to put it under the blessing. We need to put our brokenness under the blessing of God. The great task becomes that of allowing the blessing to touch us in our brokenness then our brokenness will gradually come to be seen as an opening towards the full acceptance of ourselves as God's beloved. This explains why true joy can be experienced in the midst of great suffering. It is the joy of being disciplined, of being purified, of being pruned. Just as athletes who experience great pain as they run the race can at the same time taste the joy of knowing that they are getting closer to the goal, closer to the finish line. So also can the beloved experience suffering as a way to the deeper communion for what they yearn. So we are chosen, taken by God, and so we can live with purpose and patience. We are blessed by the Holy Spirit, and so we live a life of prayer and presence. We are broken with Christ, and we partner with that brokenness, and we place it under the blessing. Now, Paul says in this passage that the Holy Spirit helps us. And this word for helps is a very interesting word. It is the word sin anti lambanamai. And Paul says that, our, that the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness and gives us further insight about how the Holy Spirit helps us. A.G. Robinson says of this word that the Holy Spirit lays hold of our weakness along with us. That's the word sin, S-Y-N. And he carries his part of the burden along with us, facing us. That's anti, as if two men were carrying a log, one at each end. So we have heavy burdens to carry, and we carry part of it, but it's just the Holy Spirit who stands face to face with us and helps us to carry. You see, the Holy Spirit doesn't give us armchair advice. The Spirit helps us to carry and to bear our weaknesses. This is real help. We may be assured that the Spirit's speaking in us and for us, 
will grasp our hope and be according to the will of God, according to uh, Romans 8 and verse 27. Now what a marvelous truth this is for us. We have two intercessors, one in heaven, our Lord Jesus, who intercedes for us before the Father, according to verse 34, and one in our hearts, the Holy Spirit himself, who helps us to bear our pain and to carry the things that we struggle with. How greatly we are loved. Because of the greatness of the coming glory and because of our weakness, we groan, but we are not alone because we are surrounded by the sympathetic groaning of creation and even of the Holy Spirit. And we are assured that one day our groaning will be replaced by glory. As people who have been taken or chosen by God the Father and who live with purpose and patience, as people who have been blessed by the Holy Spirit and who live lives of prayer and presence, as we have been broken with the Son, and as we partner with our brokenness and place it under the blessing, so we are given as God's gift to the world. And we are uh, able to be a blessing to those in our lives and those with whom we come into contact. And so let us pray. Father, we thank you that, you that you chose us, you took us in hand. Before we came to be, you knew who we were. You took us in your hand and you blessed us. You call us your beloved. And we have experienced brokenness in one way or another. But thank you, Lord, all of that has a purpose, that we should be your gift to others, that you would use us to be good news to others. Help us, Lord, to live into that. Help us, Lord, to see it as we look back over the span of our lives to see how you've been working, to identify it, and then to cooperate with you. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.